Good morning. Welcome to the Shores Church online service. It's so great to be with you, whether you're watching on your phone, your TV, your computer. It doesn't matter because you are right here with us. Today, we're continuing on in our series, Jesus Equals. And today, it's going to turn a little bit. So far in this series, as we went through Hebrews 1 all the way through chapter 10, we've looked at the idea that Jesus equals God's word, that Jesus equals God's rest, that Jesus equals God's high priest and offering, and last week, that Jesus equals God's covenant. But today, we're going to turn it a little bit. We're going to be looking at Jesus equaling something for us. The idea that we're going to be looking at today is that Jesus equals our faith. And we're going to be doing that by looking just at chapter 11. We're going to be going through almost the entirety of the chapter today because this is such a crucial, important chapter in Scripture. It's going to take away the idea that you might have heard that, well, I need to earn my faith or earn my salvation. No, you don't earn salvation. You receive it through faith. And this is the idea that we're going to be talking about today, that Hebrews 11 is a biblical hall of fame, and it's really a hall of faith. We're going to be looking at individuals who had faith in God when it looked difficult, when it looked hard, and because of their faith, they got to see awesome breakthroughs. And it's the same thing for us today. If we will simply have faith in God, we will see incredible things happen. Before we jump into the text of Hebrews 11, would you just repeat after me today, your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Well, let's go ahead. We're going to jump right into Hebrews 11. We're going to start by looking at verses 1 through 3. So would you read this with me this morning? Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Right away, we get one of the best declarations of faith, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. To me, this is one of those statements that helps me understand faith. Let's break it down a little bit. We say that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Assurance really just means I've got a confidence in that I am assured that this will happen. I have confidence. So faith is the idea of I have confidence of things hoped for. And then the second part is the conviction of things not seen, that I firmly believe that the things that I'm not seeing right now are still going to come to pass. So faith is that idea. I've got confidence in the things that I'm hoping for. I have full belief the things that I can't see are going to happen. If God speaks it, it's going to happen. There's people in our life that we have faith in, and there's people in our life that we don't have faith in. The people that we have faith in, we know that they're accountable. We know that they're uh, that we, they're faithful. That we know that if they say they're going to do something, that they are going to follow through, and they are going to do it to completion. The people that we don't have faith in, oh, they might get it done. They might not get it done. Now, realistically, we use this word faith in so many different situations. Now, when we use it in a biblical sense, we have faith that God will do things. We say that we have faith in other people. We, we say that we have faith in organizations. And our level of faith varies back and forth. That we even have the concept of blind faith. That we'll say, well, that person just has blind faith. And what does that mean? It means that you're having confidence in something with nothing to back it up. You don't firmly believe it's going to happen, but you're saying, I have faith it's going to happen. No, you have faith when you know something is going to happen, when you know the change is coming, that the things cannot simply remain the same. And here's the thing. At the end of the day, everybody has faith in something. Don't let anybody else ever tell you otherwise, that Christians and non-Christians alike have faith, that as a Christian, I have faith in God. I believe that if God's word says it, that God's word is going to come to pass and that it is true. That somebody who 
would say that I have faith that there is no God that would call themselves an atheist. They have faith, they firmly believe in what they cannot see, that God does not exist. Or someone that's agnostic, that they have faith that there is some creator or something out there, but they want nothing to do with us. Or we have other religions that have faith in what their uh, text says. But I have faith in this text, in God's word, because I've seen it come to pass. I've seen things that written come true, that I see the prophecies come true. I've experienced things in my own personal life that I know have come to pass. Now, here's the thing. Even now, I'll say this. As a scientist that would say, well, I believe in the Big Bang. Do you know that that is faith? That you have to have faith in the Big Bang? Why? Because evolution in that whole concept is called the theory of evolution. That they're theorizing, that they believe it to be true, but they can't prove it. They have to have faith in that. And to me, it is substantially easier believing that there's an almighty God who loves us, who created everything, than in a random explosion where goo went all over the place and all of a sudden it all somehow came together to, com uh, to create complex organizations on itself. You, you want to have an example? Take a watch, break it into all the pieces, all its screws, all of its in intricacies, throw it in a bag and shake it, and you're not going to get a completed watch. But there is order that came. That's why it's easy for me to believe and trust that God is a God who created everything versus just a random explosion. But we all, at the end of the day, have to have faith. It's the idea of, do I have faith in what's true? Do I have misplaced faith because I'm not putting my faith in the right things? Or do I have blind faith where I've got no facts, I have no ideas, I'm just randomly believing this because somebody told me to. And ultimately, here's the thing, I, it's why I always bring it up. You need to study God's word so you know it's true for you, not because I'm saying it or because a family member says it, but because you have experienced God on your own and you know it to be true, that your faith is based off of your relationship, not anybody else's relationship. We need to have a belief structure that allows our faith to be solid in the things of God. So now as we go through the rest of this chapter, what you're going to see is individuals who had experiences, they had personal relationships with God, and that's why they would put their faith into those things. So let's go ahead and we're going to read Hebrews 11 verses 4 all the way to 31. So read with me right now. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. 
but as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ's greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who he is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. By faith, each of these individuals faced what they were up against and they overcame. They had a test that was in front of them. But they received a testimony because they went through it. They didn't stop before the test. They didn't stop in the middle of the test. They learned the material and they went through and they received the testimony. And one of the things that we can pull away from this passage of scripture is this, is that your life is going to throw difficult things at you, things that you can't see, that you might be in the middle of one of those moments right now. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to get out of it. But we can know that if we put our faith in God, that we know that God is going to be capable of pulling us through that, that God is going to teach us something, that God is preparing us for something, and that if we put our faith that God will see us through that situation and we'll be better on the other side of that situation, that we might feel like this is a desert season, that things feel dry, that things feel barren, that things feel like there's no life, there's no hope, but that God can get us through it. And then when we're on the other side, we'll understand that season. And then we'll be able to help other people through that season as well. That the people of the Old Testament, people of the New Testament, we can see their struggles. We can see how God came through for them. And because we see both of those things, then what we can take faith in is if God did it for them, then God can do it for me. And that the people in our lives, that if God will do it for us, then they can have faith that maybe God will do it for them as well. That's why we need to keep persevering, persevering and going through. Let's talk sports for a moment. Believing the Lions would win a Super Bowl this past year. And here in St. Clair Shores, we're right outside of Detroit, so we are Detroit fans. But believing that the Lions would win a Super Bowl would be blind faith. There is nothing to suggest that they could have won anything this year. Now, you could then say the Green Bay Packers, that I might have faith in the Green Bay Packers, that they have a better quarterback, they have a better team, they have a better coach, and they had a better season, that they were going into the playoffs a potential Super Bowl team. But that would have been placing your faith in the wrong thing. And now we look at a situation that we have Tom Brady, who went from the Patriots down to the Buccaneers. And he had a team where it was full of a lot of new players, either to him, him or new players to Tampa Bay. That you had COVID, so they had less practices. And it was a really unique season this past year. And that Tom Brady, by the way, is 43 years old right now. And so he leads his team all the way to the Super Bowl, and they win the Super Bowl. And this is his seventh Super Bowl win in 10 attempts. And just for the record, there's only been 55 Super Bowls, and Tom Brady has played in 10 of them. So when we look at it of, do I believe in the Lions? Do I believe in the Packers? Or do I believe in the Buccaneers? There reaches a spot where you have to say, I've got faith 
that as long as Tom Brady is playing, that there is potential for him to win a Super Bowl. And when we, we look at it through that lens, we start even seeing things scripturally. Is that so often we might place our faith in, the, in something that there's no bearing for the faith and have blind faith. We might try and look at individuals through scripture. Well, God is going to use them and he doesn't because God's got a plan that oftentimes feels unique, feels out of left field, doesn't make sense. And it's the Tom Brady effect that when we think of Tom Brady, it doesn't make sense for a 43-year-old individual to still be playing at this high of a level and to be going to Super Bowls and winning Super Bowls. It doesn't make sense on the surface. But the thing I want to encourage you with is that with God, it may not make sense. It may not make sense to the average person, but if God's going to do something that God is going to use somebody, he's going to do it. And you can have faith and you can place your trust in him that God will be who God says he's going to be that we can trust that God is in control. And we see this example throughout scripture where all of a sudden that David versus Goliath, that when David's anointed king over all of his uh, siblings, that when Joseph receives the, the coat of many colors from his dad, that we can look at all these moments and say, it doesn't make sense in my human mind, but to God it makes sense because he sees a bigger, broader plan than we can see. And we need to have faith that God is going to do what God says he's going to do. One of my favorite examples of this is found in 1 Kings 18 with Elijah. I'm not going to read the whole passage today, but go and read the story in 1 Kings 18. It's a really fun story to, to look at. But he's having a showdown with the prophets of Baal. And they're really trying to prove, is, is God real or is Baal real? And so the 450 prophets of Baal, they go first, they get their sacrifice ready, they build their fire, and they're trying to call fire down from the heavens to burn up the sacrifice. And they're dancing and they're screaming and they, they even start cutting themselves and letting their blood pour out on this and nothing is happening. And Elijah, he is tormenting them. He's mocking them. He even gets to a spot where he says, maybe your God can't hear you because he's relieving himself on the toilet. That's where he goes. He is mocking them. And then it's his turn. And he has full faith. He has full confidence that what he can't see yet, he knows that God is capable of doing. He knows that God can come in and do an incredible thing. And so he builds his uh, sacrifice. He has a trench dug around it that is deep enough to hold four gallons of water. And then he pours water over the top of the fire, over the sacrifice, until these, this trench is completely filled with water. So there's a trench around it. The water is soaking wet. The sacrifice is soaking wet. And by the way, we are in the middle of a three and a half year drought and he uses that much water. He is putting everything on the line because if he can't deliver uh, from God Almighty in heaven, then he is making a fool of himself. But he, he does this and he calls down uh, from fire from heaven and it comes down and it happens instantaneous that he sees what everybody else can't see that this God is the real God and that he serves the real God and that God can do incredible things. He puts himself completely out there because by faith, he believes in what he can't see yet, that he knows that God spoke it to him what to do. And so he did it and he did it with full confidence. And sure enough, God came through. And we can see these examples all throughout scripture where God comes through and it may not be early. It may not be when we want it to be. It may not be, uh, it won't be late and it might be right on time and that might drive you a little bit crazy. It might drive you crazy that it's it's not when I want it or you may not get all the details of when you want them, but God will show up and do it right when he needs to do it. Have confidence and fully believe that God is capable of doing that. Now I want to get to the end of Hebrews 11 and I want to go a little bit even into chapter 12 because I want you to hear this um, th this passage this morning. But let's let's start by doing Hebrews 11, 32 through 38, and then we'll jump into chapter 12 in just a moment. So 11, 32 says this. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. 
Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering around about in deserts in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. It doesn't matter what life is going to throw at me because I will overcome. I will overcome whatever comes up against me, not because I'm great, not because I'm worthy, but because I serve the one who is great and the one who is worthy, and I can place my trust in him. That we look at just that passage again, the fact of we can think of individuals like Daniel who's thrown in the lion's den. He's not worried about what happens to him because he believes that God can take care of him in the lion's den and that he believed that God could shut their mouths. And if God doesn't, then he gets to go to eternity with God in heaven. That we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were willing to go into the fiery furnace because they weren't going to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue. That they would rather be thrown in because they know that God could protect them and save them. And even if God doesn't choose to, then God's still worthy to be praised. That we can place our faith and our trust in a God who is watching out for us, who's taking care of, of, of us. And we need to have no doubts. So when you face something today, and you might be facing something today that feels big, it feels scary, you don't know how to get through it, have faith. Have faith that God can do exactly what he says he can do for you this morning. This then brings us to Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 2. This is the kind of the, the key that ties all this together. Because if you remember, I said in the beginning, today's message was Jesus equals our faith. And I want you to hear it. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 explains this. Listen to this right now. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the author, the perfecter of our faith, and we can place our trust in God because we have Jesus. Jesus equals our faith. We have Jesus who came down that he lived the sinless life, born of a virgin, died the death that we should have, resurrected, went back up into heaven, preparing a place for us and coming again. We can trust God that Jesus is all we need, that Jesus is our faith. That we, for the longest time in the Old Testament, they had faith in what they couldn't see. We may not be able to see Jesus and have this normal like in-person relationship with him, but we can experience him through his word because guess what? Jesus equals God's word. So when we spend time here, we start understanding who Jesus is. As we understand who Jesus is, our faith grows. As our faith grows, we go out and do greater things for God because Jesus said that we would do greater things than Jesus even did. Because we have our faith in Jesus, because we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we can trust that the Holy Spirit is guiding us and leading us to do exactly what we're supposed to do. And when we walk through tests, we get the testimony, which then builds us up for the next test, and then the next test, and the next test. And we can look back and say, if God was faithful in all of those moments, then God is going to be faithful here. I don't know how it's going to look. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I can trust that my God will come through because Jesus is the author and the perfecter of my faith. And that if Jesus was willing to go to the cross, then I'm willing to as well. And why did Jesus go to the cross? Not so that he could make life good for us, but so that he could restore relationship between us in God. And as we look more like Jesus, then we need to restore relationship between others in God. We need to make other people more important than ourselves so that we can lead them to Jesus so that they can have faith, so that they can have restoration, so that they can spend eternity in heaven. It needs to not be about what I want and what I need and what I think about here on planet earth. It needs to be about restoring that individual with relationship with an almighty God who loves them passionately. And we need to go after them and share our faith. We need to be uh, individuals that share our faith because that means we're sharing our Jesus and our Jesus is incredible. This morning, I want to, I want to pray for you and that some of you might be hearing this, you know, like this, this is the first time I've ever heard this, that Jesus could be, be my faith, that Jesus could make me right with God. 
and he can, and he can do it today simply by saying, Jesus, come into my life. Would you change me? Would you transform me? Would you make me look more like Jesus? But then I think that there's some others of you that you're going through life's difficulties right now, through a struggle, that we can think of individuals like Sarah who struggle with pregnancy. We can look at individuals uh, like Moses who are leading people through a difficult time, that we can look at examples like Elijah who is uh, in a religious showdown with, with somebody and is trying to prove that God, this is who God is. I don't know what your struggle and your difficulty is, but today by faith in Jesus Christ, you can overcome this test and get to the other side and have that testimony. So I want to pray over both groupings today. This might be the very first time you accept Jesus. Accept him by faith, not by your works, because you cannot earn God's salvation. You cannot earn God's salvation. No matter what you do, does not make you right with God. But because you're made right with God by Jesus and our faith in him, then we start doing things for God because we're doing it out of a thankful heart. That's the difference. And so today, if that's you, all you have to do is say, Jesus, come in and change me. And by faith, God will. And if you're struggling with something in life, you're struggling with the test, I want to pray over you right now that God will lead you through that test, lead you through that desert season, get you to the other side and give you an amazing testimony that you can share that will build up both your faith and someone else's faith for the next challenge that they come into. Heavenly Father, Lord, I lift up your holy name today and I pray over my friends that are inviting you in their heart for the very first time, that they may not know very much about you. They may not know what you're capable of doing, but Lord, you can come in. And Lord, that you already sent Jesus to die on a cross to be resurrected, to ascend back to heaven and coming back again. Lord, that you've already done the work and that they can receive that free gift of salvation by faith faith today. So Lord, I pray that over them right now, that if they're watching and they need that faith, Lord, that you would pour your faith out, that you would pour Jesus into them, that you would change them, that you would forgive them, that you would restore them, that you would make them free right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I just pray as well over anyone who's watching this video right now, Lord, that if they're going through a test, that they don't know how to get through it, that they're in the desert, that it's barren, that they have no hope, Lord, that you would guide them through that, that you would be right there with them, Lord, that by faith, faith that you would get them to the other side where they could receive that testimony and that they could tell of the awesomeness of Jesus Christ, that they could tell of the awesomeness of God the Father that would lead them through difficult times and by faith they could battle everything that comes ahead of them. Lord, I thank you today in Jesus' incredible name. Amen. Now let's end today's service with what we always end with, with the Great Commission, the idea that by faith we know who Jesus is. So by faith we need to go out and make disciples, knowing that God will lead us to who we need to go to and speak what we need to speak. Say it with me this morning. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm so glad you joined us and we're, we're here with us throughout today's message. If today's message impacted you, would you go ahead and like it, share it, uh, comment on it, let us know what God spoke to you today. And, and make sure you get this into the hands of somebody who needs to hear this message because by faith, we believe that God can do incredible things even in their lives as well. So share it with them today. Have a blessed day. Make sure you read chapters 12 and 13 for next week as we finish off our study, Jesus Equals, on the book of Hebrews. I'll talk to you next time. We've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it! We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in! Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, like a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history. 